The Arrhenius equation in IB higher level chemistry can be a difficult one to understand intuitively. It's at the center of IB higher level chemistry's topic 16.2 about activation energy because it allows us to make quantitative predictions of the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction as far as collisions having enough energy to react is concerned. So before we go to understanding the actual equation, let's try to put it in context. It, the rate constant k, which is the, uh, this, the point of concentration of this equation basically, where you're, what you're interested in, um, is a constant of proportionality of the actual rate of reaction to various factors of, or various powers of the concentrations of the different reactants involved. Essentially, you could think about it like the rate constant is the reaction rate when all of the concentrations of the reactants involved in the reaction mixture are one mole per dm cubed. And as their concentrations go up and down, they multiply by the rate constant to scale the actual rate of reaction to whatever it would be in reality. Because the rate constant itself is this sort of abstract thing that allows us to find the allows us to find the uh, common thing that links all the different rates of reactions at different concentrations given that the rest of the conditions are constant that is temperature is constant basically multiplying by these concentrations in the reaction mixture is a way of taking this raw number which takes into account how temperature is affecting the reaction process and multiply it out by how much more frequent or less frequent um, successful collisions are only as caused by the presence of more reactants in a mixture or less reactants in a mixture. So when you have this overall picture of rate of reaction, the rate constant and the Arrhenius equation is the temperature side of things which is then multiplied by the concentration side of things to give your overall rate of reaction. So to gain more intuition as to what this equation is all about, it is going to be very helpful for you not just to think of the mathematical concept in this equation, but also to think of what each term in this equation actually means. And this is something that can be helped if we go back to thinking about collision theory as it presents itself um, from in the SL side of uh, basically reaction kinetics, the rates of reaction and how they change. Collision theory basically says that the only thing that can cause a reaction is a quote-unquote successful collision between two bodies, where each body is obviously a reactant molecule, and that these collisions, in order to cause a reaction, because all reactions are caused by collisions, but not all collisions can cause reactions, must meet a few criteria. The first of which is that they collide in the correct orientation, that is, maybe in two large complicated molecules, you want to have the functional groups that are actually interacting be meeting each other at the point of collision. And as the other condition, you want them to collide with sufficient kinetic energy. And you, the reason you want them to collide with this sufficient energy is so that the two molecules can combine to form an intermediate form so, or some intermediate product that is either the final product or will quickly decay into two more things to get your overall reaction. And there are many steps like this that go on in complicated reactions, but in general this concept of activation energy, the amount of kinetic energy you need for collisions not to just have two molecules come off in their stable forms, but rather overcome the barrier that is associated with these molecules getting more unstable as they join to form some complicated intermediate form that really doesn't want to exist. What you need for that is extra kinetic energy. For instance, imagine you were trying to put a cap back on a glue stick. If you have the cap and the glue stick and you just drop the cap on the glue stick without manipulating it further, 
just drop it really lightly. Nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be a, a cap that is sitting on top of a glue stick. But if you want your final product, the capped glue stick, you're going to have to push the cap onto the glue stick so that it stays there. And essentially, a, a successful collision in that sense is if the cap came into the glue stick with the correct orientation so that the open side of the cap fit the glue stick within it, and secondly, with sufficient energy to react. That is, the cap was flying in the glue stick with so much momentum, so much kinetic energy, that it could slide on and stay there to form it, the product, a capped glue stick. Then you get your successful collision. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the Arrhenius equation, as the IB teaches it to you, is not really its, its final form, it's not really the most accurate model humans have of um, the way that reaction kinetics worked. It's not, it's not the most accurate model that we have of how different environmental factors affect the rate of reaction, but it is pretty good. But to explain it intuitively, I think I will need to break it down into further pieces. As is done, for instance, in the... I believe it's done this way in the Oxford University Press for, the I, for IB Chemistry, their textbook. Or it may have been the Pearson one, I'm not sure. But anyway, this is not an original idea. I'm just explaining it to you after I used it to gain a better understanding of this equation myself. So, you have your equation which is really not dependent on concentration at all. Remember, it's only looking at temperature. So, what do each of these factors mean? Well, we're going to break the equation down into yet more factors. What may surprise you here is that that exponential term to the side um, in more complicated models of the rate constant is not the only thing that is dependent on temperature. So you see I've broken A, the pre-exponential factor, which is a constant, usually referred to as a constant that is determined by the number of collisions with the correct orientation when all concentrations are one mole per dm cubed, not taking into account whether the collisions have sufficient energy to be successful. So it's this number of success, number of correctly oriented collisions per second, basically. And it's broken into two pieces. One is P, which is the steric factor. It's a number between zero and one. And it's called P because it's essentially a probability. It's a probability of the collision between the two molecules being in the correct orientation to react. And then you've got this other term. And overall, this other term is usually given the name Z um, for collision number. And this is just the raw pure form of the number of collisions per second not taking into account whether they are correctly oriented and not taking into account whether they have sufficient energy to react. And the thing is, if we are to believe the original Arrhenius equation, Z would have to be actually constant. That square root T term is not acceptable to us because it violates the model that um, the only thing dependent on temperature is that exponential term. But the thing is, that's really not the case. The exponential term represents the number of collisions with sufficient energy to react. Uh, it's the proportion of collision with sufficient energy to react because T, temperature, absolute temperature in Kelvin, will always be a positive number from zero to some very large number possibly. And that means that this fraction here will always be positive, and this minus sign means that this entire exponent, this entire input to the exponential function, is always going to be positive. It is always going to be negative, sorry, between zero and negative infinity. That basically means the range of outputs for this e to the something is between zero and one, including one, excluding zero, of course. Uh, but that, that's just how it mathematically works out. This 0 to 1 is a proportion of reactions. It's multiplied by P, another proportion of reactions, but this term itself means number of reactions with sufficient, a number of proportion of collisions with sufficient energy to react. 
the reason we have this complicated e to the something term in here is because it's mathematically derived from the actual function that allows you to graph a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Because if you remember from topic 6, actually I can, I can see that's not showing up properly on the video, hang on. If you remember from topic number 6, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and how it describes sort of the distribution of the kinetic energies of particles um, in a reaction mixture or just in the world, in some gas, liquid, whatever you know that this exponential factor is going to be the proportion of these particles, basically, with sufficient energy to react. Um, and it works out that if one axis is... I'm, I'm not sure specifically how you get this graph. I suspect it's like the sum of two Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions or the sum of two variables that are Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed which I think itself is just another Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Um, you want to find this shaded area because if, if you're someone who does IB AA maths, at least SLAA maths, I think you will have come across the idea of a probability density function, a curve that has the entire area under it be equal to 1 so that um, any area, like this one for instance, shows the probability that the value will have sort of this range of values, right? From the activation energy to infinity. And that, that's essentially what the proportion of particles with sufficient energy to react is. It's this mathematical function the, for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that was derived from some first physical principles of modeling that I myself am not familiar with. You have this probability density function, Fe, where E is the energy you're looking at, and you want to find the proportion or the probability that any two particles has sufficient energy to react which will be the same as the proportion of collisions that have sufficient energy to react, I think. I'm not entirely sure of this because I'm fairly certain there is an effect where particles with less energy just collide with other things less frequently. So don't, don't take this to be 100% true, but it's still a useful way of understanding it. It's sort of the... the so while this curve might not be the maximal Boltzmann distribution exactly, it, I, it's definitely related. It would be the integral of this probability density function of, this is not really, this is a more like total energy of particles in any given collision. total energy of particles in any given collision, you want the probability that it's above the activation energy. The integral from the activation energy to infinity. That is, probability that E is above EA for some uh, random continual distri continually distributed variable. Um, so. If that, if that gives a bit more mathematical insight to you, then I'm extremely happy about that because that's kind of one of the main things I was trying to get across in this video. And essentially, if you were to evaluate that integral down here, you would get the exponential term in the Arrhenius equation, e to the minus ea over rt, where r is the gas constant as seen in the ideal gas law pv equals nrt, and T is the absolute temperature in Kelvin, EA is the activation energy in kilojoules per mole, which is sort of that vertical distance on the reaction phase diagram, because this is an amount in kilojoules per mole, to get your final answer for the proportion of collisions that will have sufficient energy to react, and that's one part of the Arrhenius equation. So, now that I've explained this, I'm going to explain 
um, z and p. p is very simple. It's something you need to empirically determine. It's sort of some variable that you change so that the Arrhenius equation for a particular reaction can fit well to the experimental data. But we still need to consider this z, this collision number, and why it is somewhat dependent on temperature. So, if you took IGCSE chemistry, or an earlier chemistry qualification than the IB, or even in the IB itself, you would know qualitatively that an increase in temperature increases the rate of reaction for two reasons. The first reason being the increase in the proportion of collisions with energy greater than the activation energy. But the second reason being that the molecules in general in the reaction mixture will move faster and therefore collide more frequently. So this idea of the molecules moving faster is expressed within the collision number because the collision number is just the number of collisions per second when all concentrations are one mole per dm cubed and naturally this is dependent on the speed of the particles because faster particles collide more often. It's not yet taken into account. So there is actually a very large and complicated expression for z itself that is dependent on things like um, I don't know, the, the size of the molecules and more to do with how they interact with one another. There are various assumptions made in this model for the, for the collision number, such as all molecules are spheres which don't interact unless they touch, and so on and so forth. But the model boils down to the calculation that the collision number is proportional to the square root of the absolute temperature, root t. And I've made the rest of the equation into this simple constant kz um, for simplicity. So the thing is, this collision number indeed is not really a constant, but and there's a big there's a big qualifier to be noted here. This is root t. Most chemical kinetics investigations take place over a range of temperatures such that root T is not actually going to change that much compared to e to the minus Ea over Rt. For instance, if you had an investigation with temperatures ranging from, say, 27 degrees Celsius to 77 degrees Celsius, that range, for instance, um, that's just for the sake of argument to make conversion to Kelvin easier. 300 to 350 Kelvin has a range of root T between about 17.3 for root 300 Kelvin and 18.7 for root 350 Kelvin. So that's a change of about 8% um, in this term. Now, if you compare the change in this term, which is kind of constant but not really, to the change in the proportion of collisions with sufficient energy to react, assuming that the reaction has some reasonable activation energy like 50 kilojoules per mole, you see that this exponential factor um, for a low temperature like 300 Kelvin goes from 2, to the, two times 10 to the power of minus 9, nine billionths to 34 times 10 to the minus 9 or 34.2 times 10 to the minus 9 and that's a jump that's an increase by a factor of 17 which is it's basically so much more significant than the change to the collision number that the model usually works quite well by taking the collision number to be constant especially in terms of taking the collision number to be ex determined experimentally. So if z is constant, then we become comfortable with collapsing z times p into this one pre-exponential factor a. And that pre-exponential factor accounts for, as I say, the number of collisions per second, as well as 
the proportion of collisions in the correct orientation. And that's where A, the pre-exponential factor, gets its meaning. And likewise, for the exponential factor, e to the minus a over rt, it's a very small number usually, as I showed you, as I, as I spoke about earlier, for instance, at 27 degrees Celsius might be 2 in a billion. That means for every 1 billion collisions between reactant particles, only two reactions take place, which is something pretty crazy to think about, actually, because it, it kind of messes with your intuition as to how these collisions work. It's just that the number of collisions that actually cause a reaction is so, so tiny. Anyways, Hopefully, this video gave you some more insight into the Arrhenius equation and the meaning behind it. This expansion of A into the different components that give it its meaning, hopefully, allows you to understand the equation more deeply. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe or leave a comment or even email me at the email address on my about page, watchmedomath at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for watching.